praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you because you are a good father. Thank you because you are a righteous father. Thank you for your boundless love over our lives. Be thou glorified in the name of Jesus. Thank you because you have given us eyes to see this day, ears to listen this day, minds to understand this day. We return all the glory to your name. Be thou exalted, Father. We want to look into your word once again. We ask, precious Father, that you speak to us. Bless us by your word tremendously. In the end, let the glory be to your holy name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, we are welcome once again to uh, SGS Teachings. And um, last week, we began to talk about uh, God's almightiness. And we said one of the most uh, misunderstood concepts in the Bible is God's mightiness, God's almightiness. When we say God can do all things, people do not understand it. It's a pity that Christians also understand this concept just the way people in the world understand it. And we who are Christians, we are, we are the ones who are expected to know God. We are the ones who are expected to be able to defend God's interest. We are the ones who are ordained to be close to Him. We are the ones who are given the ability to understand Him. Anybody, any, any, any Tom, Dick and Hardy, anybody in the world, can just think God is God can do all things and that is as far as it goes. And they believe he could save this person, he didn't save him, he could do this, he didn't do it, he could kill. He could, of course, all these things have a touch of truth. But as God's children, we are the ones ordained. We, 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 our theme is first John 5 verse 20 that says. For we know that the Son of God is come, and He has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true. It says, This is the true God and eternal life. So, we who are believers, we are the ones who are expected to know God, and that is why. We are taking this series. Hallelujah. Because through this series, we will uh, we will expose some mysteries about God's nature to us. This will help us to know him better. You know, um, if you don't know somebody, for example, probably you have a boss, you don't know him, but then you are privileged that somebody tells you, ah. Your guys like this, your guys like that, your guys like this, your guys like that. You know, somehow it will affect your relationship with him because somebody has told you. But that is never enough. How do you know that? Just knowing about somebody is not enough uh, to, to build a relationship with them. You now need to go to them and relate with them on that level so that your, 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 your union with them become better. Hallelujah. I saw this movie some years ago. Uh, Fireproof is the title. And there's this man who was losing his wife, became born again, and started trying to gain his wife back. And, you know, the wife already gave him divorce papers and all of that. The wife is almost going out with somebody else. And, you know, this husband kept on doing the right thing, kept on helping the wife, kept on blessing the wife, even when the wife is not even away. So the wife's um the wife's mom had been 
sick and needed a huge sum of money to you know provide some medical services that will make our time on earth better and you know he has been trying to speak to the husband to pay for a long time the husband would not even listen because he has been trying to save up for his own personal ambition to, to, to buy a yacht so eventually this husband did uh went there paid everything for the for the for the uh, wife's home and the woman was not aware he thought it was someone else who donated just a little amount <laughs> you know i'm trying to drive home a point so on this fateful day she was just speaking to a colleague at work and that colleague at work eventually exposed to him that, exposed to her that it was your husband who paid all the bill and you know she knows how much that yacht is important to the husband and the other needed to withdraw all the money and use that money for her mom and for, for the very first time she broke down and was in tears and what happens this helped he helped her to appreciate her husband better helped her to love her husband better because now somebody tells you something about your husband you are not aware of things he has been doing in secret for your interest you are not aware of when you get to know things like these it boosts your love for that person and that is exactly what we are trying to do through these teachings we are trying to show you from the scripture the nature of god because god wants to be loved god wants to be known i have sh i will share this in the, in the last few teachings god wants to be loved he desires to be loved because you cannot con that is one thing you cannot control god could make people obey him have you know that <laughs> god could make people obey him if i put a gun to your head you would definitely want to obey me <laughs> especially if you know you can't beat me Hallelujah. If I put a gun to your head and I say, Mr. Man, give me your money or you die. You know, you don't need to love me. You just need to obey and choose to give me the money, right? Mr. Man, sweep the floor. Mr. Man, kneel down or I shoot you. Anybody will want to obey. You don't want to die. <laughs> so what God really desires is not obedience. God can make people obey him. It is in the Old Testament. But you cannot make somebody love you. You cannot force somebody to love you. The love has to be produced in their heart. And the only way to produce love in somebody is to love them. The Bible says he loved us. We love him because he first loved us. So you see, the emphasis of the New Testament is not obedience but love. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So what God expects from you is that if you now love me, you will keep my commandment. Glory to Jesus. So you see, the, em the entire emphasis of this series is for us to come to a place where we know God enough to love him. And if we know God enough to love him, then we love him enough to obey him. We will love him enough to go all out for him. God wants to be loved and he wants to be known. One of the reasons why our love for him is so uh, small is because we have not yet received his love. We don't know him enough. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. So tonight we continue, talk, continue talking about uh, the almightiness of God. Last week we established that we cannot blame God for the things happening on earth today because he is not the ruler of the earth. I can't preach that all over again. The teachings on our telegram page, if you missed it, go and listen and you see all the scriptures we read. And there are more, we just couldn't read them all. Do not give God what, do not 
crown God, give God a crown that is not his. He is not the ruler of the earth. That's what the Bible says. Satan is the ruler of the earth. And you can see what he's doing with the earth. We can see how much, how much he's doing with it. And last week we explained how Satan got the authority to rule the earth. How Satan got the influence to rule the earth. He rules the earth through, through manipulation. And as long as he can get the majority vote, he wins. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So that was what we discussed last week. The moment you understand that God does not rule the earth, then you will stop putting the blame on him for every evil thing that happens on earth. You will stop blaming him. I, like, I, like I said, if you no want to know where God is ruling, where you can blame him for everything that is happening, go to heaven. God is ruling in heaven. He is the king in heaven. Burnett, no, 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 he didn't, he didn't make himself king. We read Genesis 1, 20, where the Bible says, he gave man the dominion. We read Psalm 1, 1, 5, verse 15, where it says, he has given the earth to man. The Bible says, the heaven of the heavens are of the Lord. I think it's Psalms 1, 1, 5, verse 16. It says, but the earth has he given, as he committed to the hands of men. Unbelievers, anytime bad things happen, is, is God. Good thing happens, is God. There are some good things that was not caused by God, though. They are good, but God didn't sanction it. God did not want it. God did not desire it, but they are good. They are seemingly good to human beings. Let me put it that way. Hallelujah. So when bad things happen, they will say, ah, that's how God wants it. Islam teaches this to the extreme. Everything is God that allowed it. It's God that permitted it. It's God that did it. Everything, whatever it is that happened, it is God that permitted it. It is God that did it. And you see, this kind of understanding spread also among Christianity. Somebody dies, ah, maybe God used it for something. A child, a, 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 a parent, a, a, parent a, a woman carries a child. A woman carries a child for nine months and on the day of delivery, the wife died, the woman died, the child died. They say maybe there's something God did with it. What is God doing with it? That he could not do and still avoid the death of those two lovely people. And sometimes because we prayed and prayed and prayed and we did not see results, we say maybe that is what God, that's how God wants it. Maybe that is what God wants. Maybe that is how God wants it. And every time we try to achieve things and we can't get it, we say it is God. Every time we try to achieve the same thing and get it, we say it is God. Because we do not understand. The Bible says, don't be ignorant. Understand what the will of God is. There was this woman in the book of Acts that was screaming, these are the servants of the Lord, believe in them. These are the servants of the Lord, believe in them. If it were people in our today's age, they would say, that, woman, that girl is a prophetess. Ah, she's a prophet of God. This one knows Jesus. She could not have been saying that if, not, if, if God did not permit it. She's able to do it because Holy Spirit revealed it to her. You will carry the way. But Paul was not carried away because he understands the will of God. He says, Mr. Woman, Mrs. Woman, shut your mouth and stop saying rubbish. So as believers, don't just, don't be um, universal in your understanding. Don't be universal in your approach. Seek to know God. When bad things happen in your life, find out what is going on. Don't just say that is how God wants it. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. 
Bible says we must not be unwise, but understand the will of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. So today we'll continue talking about God's almightiness. And we would like to ask one very wonderful question today. Why did God not make all things good? And I've begun to talk about this. I'm just going to uh, expound more on this. You know, when we, when we begin to understand God, then we will learn how to love him. Then we will be able to love him more. Some of us, we are, we are worshipping a deity. We have not fallen in love with a father. We only accept him as a deity. You know, when you have a deity, even if he, even if he asks, even if he kills your child, whatever that deity does, you know, you still keep on worshipping him. He's, uh, he's our deity, though. The king may ask them to bring your child, let them kill him. What are you going to do? <laughs> you are just a slave to a deity. Just accept. Hallelujah. But Jesus has not called us to worship a deity. Not only worship, but also to know him as a father and love him. God help us in Jesus' name. So why can't God make all things good? Praise the Lord. Psalm 8, verse 1 to 8. Psalm 8. God can do all things. He could just flip his fingers. And everything can become good. Why did he not do that? He could do it. Why didn't he? Let's read Psalm 8 from verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens? Hallelujah. Verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, as thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Can you see that? That's a, that's a very big mystery there. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling, you ordained strength. You ordained strength because of your enemies. So that you can shut up the enemy and the avenger. Now, this is a big question. I'm not going to explain it. The, if, if you read, if you continue reading this chapter, you see that the Bible is talking about man and the creation of man. If you read verse 3, it says, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Can you see that? It's talking about the creation of man. Thou made him to have dominion over the work of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So you see, he's talking about man here. Hallelujah. So in verse 2 here, he's giving us a very powerful mystery about the creation of man. And he's saying that one of the reasons why God will not just tap his finger and just sort out things is because God has a purpose. And what's the purpose? This scripture shows us. He says, out of the mouth of babies and suckling, you have given them strength. You have ordained them to be strong. You have planned them to be strong. Why did you plan them to be strong? Because of your enemy. Now, see, God has an enemy. And you know who God's enemy is? It's Satan. It's Lucifer. God wants to deal with Satan. But God feels, no, I am too big. <laughs> it will, I will be descending so low to be dealing with Satan. That will be too low for me. So he ordained man to have enough strength and capacity so that when Satan raises his ugly head, they will deal with him. I'll read it again. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling, 
thou hast ordained strength because of thy enemy, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. So God wants to prove how big he is to Satan. He wants to really show him, you are too small. It's, I, won't, I won't try to deal with you. It is this ones, this my children that will deal with you. So that was one of the reasons why God allowed Satan to tempt the woman. To tempt man. Because he expects that I have given you enough capacity to deal with this Satan. But men failed. And because men failed, God will not change his purpose. Just because you failed to do what God asked you to do, God's purpose stands sure. He is not about to change his purpose because you failed. <laughs> no, he won't. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. God will not change his purpose because you failed. So immediately man fell, what did God do? God reestablished his purpose. He said concerning the serpent, he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and his seed and he shall bruise your head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's Genesis chapter 3. God reestablished his purpose. That my purpose is that the son of man will deal with the seed of the devil. It is man that will deal with the devil, not me. And that will explain to you why God could not deal with the devil from heaven. He had to become man, stripped himself of every abilities of God and became man. The Bible says it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In all things, that's what the Bible says in, in the book of Hebrews. The Bible says, it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren in all things. So that's why you see Jesus, he always calls himself the son of man. Always. Always. Because he wants you to know that I am like you. I am you. If I can do it, you can do it. I came here to represent the best of you. So when man fell, if God had just obliterated the devil and just destroyed him, his purpose would have been defeated. But when plan A failed, God swung into plan B. And, and the Bible says the first Adam was made a living soul. The second Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam came to finish. God ordained man. To help him to silence his enemy. But man failed. So God needed to become man. To prove that men can do it. This is an assignment I gave to men. And it is men that will put the devil to flight. In our generation. Both me and you. We put the devil to flight in the name of Jesus. So it is our duty to deal with the devil. That was part of God's ordained plans for our lives. And because Adam failed, God is not about to change his purpose. Hallelujah. The head, who is Jesus, has divided Satan. Now it is left for the body. The Bible says, sit down, sit down at my right hand. Till I make your enemies your footstool. Yes, the head, who is Jesus, has defeated the devil. But the whole body must defeat him. God must bruise the devil on, under our feet shortly. So number one, reason why God cannot just destroy the devil is because we have an assignment we are yet to fulfill. It is our duty to put the devil to flight. And until that purpose is achieved, nobody is going anywhere. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So number two, 
Why did God not tap his finger and make everything good when it didn't fail? And let's start over. It's because God loves man and cannot judge Satan without judging man. Now, please understand this. God loves men and cannot judge Satan without judging men. When man sinned, if God wanted to destroy Satan, he could not do it without also destroying men. Because through the sin of man, man has formed a bond with the devil. And because man formed a bond with the devil, if God will destroy the devil, he will have to destroy man too. Otherwise, he will not be a just God. Matthew 13 verse 30, the Bible says, when they told Jesus that the enemy have sold weeds in your maize farm. Ha. Jesus said, they said, should we go and destroy the weeds? Jesus said, no, 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 no. That's not, that's not our way. If we attempt, if there is, a, there is a mixture, there is a bond between the wheat and the tares, if we attempt to destroy the weeds now, if we are not careful, we will destroy the, the, the weeds also. So what did he say? Let them both grow together. Well, let them both grow together until the harvest. Acts 17 verse 20, the Bible says, There is an appointed day, an appointed day of harvest, when God will speak to the angels, trust in your sickle to the earth, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. A time is coming when God will harvest the earth. But if he harvest the earth before the time, many who are ordained to righteousness will be lost. So if God had attempted to destroy the devil from the beginning, he would have done the same with man because he's a just God. Man is now carrying the signature of the devil. So whatever faith away the devil was await him. If God now judge Satan and leave man, he would not be a just God. And he is a just God. The Bible says, heaven and earth may pass away, but not his word. And that leads me to number three. Why won't God just tap his finger and make all things good? Because God cannot go back on his word. Or he cannot go back on his principle. One of God's principles says in the book of Romans chapter 6 verse 16, the Bible says, To whom you yield yourself servants to obey, servants you are. That word translated servant is from, is, is from a word that actually means slave. So, Bible says, when you obey somebody, you become their slave. That is the principle of God. And when you become the slave of somebody, wherever goes the master, goes the slave. So, despite the fact that Satan uh, did wrong and deceived men, if God had planned to judge Satan and immediately cast him to hellfire, Adam and Eve would have followed him because he has become their master. I hope you are getting the point. So you understand why God had to wait for 4,000 years. It's not because he just wished for men to perish and suffer, but because he is constrained by his word. He said, I can never go back on my word. If I have said it, so shall it be. God does not go back on his word. He's not man that he should lie. Instead of God to change his word, he will make a new decree that will not devoid the previous word, but he will never change his word. Never. There is a thing called judgment. And judgment is the will of God. 
But anytime God wishes to change his word on judgment, he introduces a new word that we call mercy. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So as, as, as judgment may be a principle under God, but so is mercy. Mercy is also a valid principle under God. It depends on the one that you access. Praise the Lord. Praise the living Jesus. So God cannot go back on his word. If he had judged Satan, without judging men, they will become a liar. And because God cannot lie, so he couldn't do that. So he needed a special and unique way to perform a, what's this chemistry word? To perform a fractional distillation to separate man from Satan. Hi, God is a good God. You may not know yet, but now you should know. He cannot lie. He cannot go back on his word. He rather that he will lay down his own life than change his word. You know, he had options. If he, if, if, he, if he wanted to destroy Satan, the only thing he has to let go is man. Man also will perish with the devil and that will be the end. But because of his love for us, because he cannot change his word, he had to say, okay, I have said something, I can't change it. The only thing I can do is to lay down my life. To undo, to, 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 to undo what men have done. Hallelujah. So you can understand this God. As I'm speaking to you, God will be revealing himself to your heart. You begin to wonder that how good is this God? When the Bible says, what is man that you are mindful of him? When that writer is speaking, he knows what he's saying. He said, when I look at your heavens, when I look at, when I look at how great you are, I, I, I still did not get it. What is man that you are mindful of me? Or the son of man that you visit him? What is so special about the man that God created? Because he bestowed his love upon him. 4 John 3 or 4 John 4 there about. John said, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us. Number four, why can't God make all things good? Why can't he just tap his finger and every suffering on earth should end? Why can't he just snap his finger? He's the almighty. Is he not the almighty? Why can't he just tap his finger and everything goes back to reset? We share three points. Number four, God needs man cooperation. To walk on the earth. I will repeat it. Because that may offend somebody. God needs man's cooperation. God needs man's partnership. To operate on the earth. Now that sounds somehow. But that is the truth. That is the power. That is the love of a just God. That is, the, that is the humility of a good God. If there is anybody who is humble, it is God. If there is anyone who is disciplined, who stands by their word, it is God. Last week we discussed that God has given the earth to man. So he takes the earth. Psalm 115 verse 16. He says, Mr. Man, I have given you the earth. Watch over it, control it. Hmm. The Bible speaks of a righteous man. Psalm 15. I think, uh, is it Psalm 15 now? That's 15, verse 5 or verses or there about. He says, a righteous man, he swears to his own heart and change not. That's God. Even when the decree he makes, even if those decree comes back to backfire on him, he will not change his word though. That's good. Hallelujah. Remember the story of David. Despite the fact that the children of David kept on 
disobeying God, starting from Solomon to, to Rehoboam, on and on and on and on. They kept on doing wrong. God will always tell you that I have made a covenant with David and I cannot go back on it. That's God. He could have destroyed all of them. But the Bible says, when he remembers his covenant with David, if I, someone will tell himself, instead of me to destroy you, I will remember my covenant with David. It doesn't change his word. When he says something, it becomes binding. It becomes a covenant. It becomes a law. And that law binds him. That is how humble he is. It's not like our politicians who we make our laws, but they will go and bend it for their own shooting. They will say this road is one way, but then if there is traffic, they will pass there. Nobody will, nobody, 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 nobody will arrest them. God is not like that. When God makes a commandment, even if that commandment comes as it is to his detriment, it does not change his mind. Though. So when God gave the earth to man <laughs> by his word, he cannot go back to operate on that earth without man giving him entrance. Can you see that? He will never operate on that earth without man giving him access and read your bible you will see it consistently from old to new he will always ask for partnership god is always looking for a man why <laughs> why is god always looking for a man say i am looking for a man Isaiah heard the cry of God from heaven. Who shall we send? Who will go for us? Why can't he send himself? Because he has given the earth over to man. And he will not come back and operate there without any man giving him access. How can you claim you gave somebody something? You said, I said, uh, my, my brother, I give you this house. It's for you. And then I keep I keep a, I keep a spare key. And anytime I, I I feel like I feel like I want to just move around, I will open the key behind his back, open the door behind his back, and be and be doing this in his house, because I said Shabi, I gave him the house. No 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 no, that men can do that, but God won't do that. When He gives you, He gives you. If God gave you something, and you say God, when well, you have given me, I'm not giving you back. God will be looking at you. He will withdraw his grace. And one day you will, you know, <laughs> you will run out of, you will run out of, 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 of supply because you are caught away from your source. Deuteronomy 7 verse 17. Let's read some scriptures to back up what I just said. The book of Deuteronomy. God made a very huge statement here. If you are not reading KJV, you may not get it properly. Because some other versions twisted that scripture. Deuteronomy 7 verse 17. God was speaking here. He said, Okay, let me read from verse 16 so you can get the point. He said, And you will consume all the people which the Lord thy God will deliver thee. Your eye shall have no pity upon them. Neither shall thou serve their gods, for thou will be a, they will be a snare unto thee. Now, see what verse 17 says. It says, But if you shall say in your heart that these nations are more than me, God says, Then how can I dispossess them? Can you see that? God just told the Israelite that I have ordained you. My plan and purpose for you is to destroy every country that comes your way. But he says, but if you suddenly now say in your heart that ah ah ah, these nations they are more than me, oh, they, these nations can defeat me, oh, God says, you make me powerless in dispossessing them. I won't be able to help you. 
Yes, it is my plan to destroy these nations. Yes, it is my plan to give them to you. But if you in your heart, you say that these nations, they are bigger than you, then I'm sorry, I won't be able to help you. Despite the fact that it is my will, despite the fact that it is my plan, because you, un you believe wrongly, you will fold my hands from helping you. And what happened in, in, in the book of Numbers chapter 13, verse 28 to 33? Numbers chapter 13, 28 to 33. That's exactly what happened. Moses sent 12 spies to spy on the land of the giants, on their Canaan. When they came back, you know the story. Ten said, ah, no, they all said, it is a good land. The land is flowing with milk and honey. As a matter of fact, there are, there are, there are, there are, the, the, there are, the fruits there are very big. Everything is very beautiful. In fact, they but they bought. They said, but there are giants in the land. They said, those giants, we are before them like grasshoppers. We are like grasshoppers before them. And they begin to cry and begin to say, hey, no, we can't go. And do you know that God was angry with that generation? As you have said, mouth, that's what you are going to get. You have said that these nations are greater than you. You have said that you cannot take this nation. That is what you will get. And all of them died in the wilderness. Because they said with their mouth, they refused to give God access in their life. Despite the fact that it was the will of God for them. But because they refused to cooperate with divinity, they could not bring God's power to avail in their lives. They all perished. So God cannot just change everything without the, the cooperation of man. That's, now, now, now look, look at this catch. That same nation, that same country, that a old Israel said they cannot defeat one man and his tribe defeated them. The man Caleb. In Joshua 14, verse 6 to 15, he was at the age of 85 or 80 or thereabout. He said, When I was 40 years of age, that word was released. And I am still strong enough. The word of God kept him strong and fighting and agile till 85. And what a whole nation of history say they cannot defeat. One man and his small tribe defeated them. All of that tell you, God is limited by your belief. Despite the fact that he is the almighty God. Despite the fact that he can do all things. The Bible says, if you say in your heart that this problem is more than me. He says, I will not be able to help you. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Glory to Jesus. So when we talk about God's almightiness, you must understand the scope. Otherwise, you will not be able to fellowship accordingly with your father. How can you fellowship with a God who watches who watch children die hungry? How can you claim somebody is your father? And there are, there, are, there are thousands of people, thousands of people dying every year of malaria. Children. Over 600,000 children die yearly of malaria. And your God did not do anything about it and he can do it. How can you fellowship accordingly with a God like that? Except you understand that he is not the ruler of the earth. That God is willing to heal all those people only if he sees somebody that will cooperate with him. 
Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. God needs your cooperation. And he needs the cooperation man on this side of the universe to exact and enforce his will. Let's read Psalm 78, verse, 40, verse, verse 41. Very powerful you need to know them by heart otherwise what i mean will look like nonsense to you it is yourself something the bible gives us clues yes about the nature of God. Psalm 78 verse 41. Now listen. Because we like to sing songs about how mighty God is. Yes, God is mighty. He, there is no limit to his power. But you need to understand the constraint he puts upon himself as touching man and his earth. See verse 41, the Bible says, Yea, they turned back and tempted the tempted God and limited the only one of Israel. Can you see that? They turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Now let me ask you a question. Can God be limited? The answer is no. He is the Almighty. He can't be limited. He is the Creator. How can He be limited? But here the Bible is saying that Israelites tempted God and limited Him. How can you limit God? You cannot limit God in heaven. No. But you can limit God in your life. You can limit God in your church. You can limit God in your family. You can limit God in your work. You can limit the influence of God in your life if you don't open the door for him to operate. That is why Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Matthew 6, verse 10. Jesus said, pray. Let one of your prayers be, let your kingdom come, and let your will be done. Many of us believe that everything that happens on earth is the will of God. If that, if that is the case, then Jesus will not ask us to pray that the will of God should be done on earth. Get that. The reason why we need to pray so that his will shall be done on earth is because if we don't pray... If we don't believe, if we don't do our part, the will of God will not be done automatically. Without our prayer, without our faith, without our believing, things will not happen. Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, the Bible says, Whatsoever thing you bind on the earth is bound in heaven, not vice versa. Many of us expect God to bind something in heaven. So when God is ready, we do it. Ah, I'm sorry for you. He said, when God binds it in heaven, then it will be bound on earth. When God remembers me, it will come to pass. Be careful. Be careful. You don't say that except you understand the will of God for your life. Otherwise, Satan will eat your cake, eat the icing, and give you the nylon to go and throw in the dustbin. If you don't understand God's will and purpose for your life, if you don't understand God's will according to the scripture, the Bible says, whatsoever thing you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Say, so I will sanction whatever thing you sanction. John chapter 22 or thereabout or 20. 
He said, whatsoever thing you remit, I will also remit. Anything you endorse, I will also endorse. Anything you reject, I will also reject. Anything you accept, I will also accept. The, I have given you authority. And you have my backing on whatever it is you decide. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Matthew 26, verse 53 and 54. Matthew 26. Let's just read it as we begin to try and close. Matthew 26. Verse 53 and 54. Jesus was speaking here. And he gave us a very important clue. Now, they came to arrest Jesus. And, you know, Peter, the smart one, took up his sword and tried to defend Jesus. And fear, he caught the ear of one of his servants. I'm sure he targeted that guy's head. The guy just managed to, to dodge. And, you know, his ear was gone. And Jesus see Jesus' response. And see the clue he left for us in his words. Hallelujah. He said, put up again your sword into, your, into its place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Now, see verse 53, that's where we are going. He said, don't you think. Now, listen, listen very carefully. Please, children of God, listen to this. This is God's word. And the old, inside of them is buried the knowledge and the understanding of God. He says, don't you think that I can now? Don't you think that I cannot? Do you think I can't pray now to my father? And he will presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? You see that? But how then shall the scripture be fulfilled? Now get this. Jesus said, Peter, stop fighting. If I wanted to fight, I would tell my father to give me thousands of angels and they will defend me and my father will give me. He said, but if I should do it, the word of God will not be fulfilled. Now, this is what I want you to get. Jesus said, I can ask my father and my father will answer me. Meaning that I can ask my father for something that is not his perfect will. God's perfect will is for Jesus to go to the cross. But Jesus said, I can also pray to my father. And he will give me angels that will defend me. And my father will give me. Despite the fact that that is not his perfect will. Because I ask him, he will give me. Hallelujah. Can you see that? Many of our prayer points, they get answered, but they are not in perfect will with God. They are not in accordance with the will of God. This morning, I went to minister in church, and uh, two coppers came to me. And one of them said, wanted me to pray for her, and she said, she wants to redeploy back to, I think, Calabar or Jeribar, that she has been offered a job in Calabar as a lecturer. And she wants to go back there and uh, she wants to, she wants them to, she wants to be redeployed back there. I was actually tired because I needed to go and do some other things. And I just needed to break that discussion quickly. Otherwise, I would have schooled her on understanding the will of God. Many of us, we don't want the will of God. We just want our will. And when you live like that, you drive yourself to a place where God does not want for you. And you end up miserable. It is only in the center of God's will that you find everything that God wants. That is where God will send your allocation. Praise the Lord. I just prayed with her and just let her go. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Majority of the people, they just want to use God for their will. They don't want God to use them for His will. 
So Jesus here is not like us who does want to use God for his will, or use God for their will. Jesus said, I have the ability to use God for my will, but I will not do it because I want his will to come to pass in my life. It is his will is what I want, not my will. So you see that even our answered prayers can take us further from the will of God. So that God answered a prayer or a sin does not answer is not a guarantee that that is his will for your life. He answered or did not answer does not mean it is his will for you. You need to find out his will. You need to surrender to his will in your life. Because many people think if it works, then it is the will of God. If it does not work, <laughs> it is still the will of God. Ah, for God's sake. You know, people in the Old Testament, they had no revelation of Satan. Read the Old Testament. You notice that. Just read from Genesis to Malachi. I think Satan is mentioned only eight times in the Old Testament and probably uh, probably nine times and eight of it is in the book of Job. You can imagine. Even despite the fact that Job went through everything he went through, he never understood that it was Satan that was, that was on his case. He never made mention of Satan once. All he said was, God has done this. So in the Old Testament, when good happens, it is God. When bad happens, it is God. If people are, 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 are barren, God shut their womb. If people are hungry, God made them hungry. If there is famine in the, in the land, then God brought the famine. Every good, bad, or ugly thing that happened, it is God. Why? Because they had no understanding that there is somebody called Satan who does bad, and there is a God who does good. They didn't have that understanding. And some of us, we pitch our pains behind them. When Jesus came, he came to let us know that there is a, 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 a father who is a good father and there is a Satan who comes to steal and kill and destroy. No, they are different. Somebody died, you prayed. Well, did not come to life. You say, eh, it was God that took him. God loved him more than we love him. We love him, but God loved him more. Ah! And many children have heard that and gotten angry. God, why will you love my father more than me and take him away from me? Why don't you love me enough to make my father stay with me and take care of me? And they become angry. Some of them become atheists because somebody has preached to them that God took their father from them because he loved their father more than they love him. And that man may even be in hellfire. We God give us understanding in the name of Jesus. So we must understand the will of God and pray that his will should come to pass. We can't just assume that when things happen, it's the will of God. Because you prayed and you don't see answers for five years, you say that ah, when God is ready, we do it. Hallelujah. Now let's tell people. How many people came to Jesus? Hey, Jesus healed me. And Jesus said, Mr. Hey, wait, your time has not yet come. Wait for 30 more years. That is when God has ordained to heal you. Or somebody comes to God and says, God, I've been, I've, I've been, I've, I've been barren for, for, for 30 years. And Jesus says, Yes, your appointed time is the 35th year. So wait for your time. No, 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 no. Everyone who comes to him, they get their results instantly, instantly, instantly. Just because we don't have many people like Jesus on earth, we blame God for doing many wrongs. We blame God for not asking our prayers. We blame God for not removing sorrow in our lives. Let his mind be in you. Reorientate your knowledge of God. It will help you to fellowship better with him. It will help you to love him the more. It will help you to appreciate him the more. 
it will help you to worship him in spirit and in truth many of us are worshiping god in the flesh and in lies you will not be able to worship god appropriately if you don't know the truth about him the son of man has come and he has given us an understanding that we know him that is true let's bow down our heads for prayer father we thank you thank you because you are a good god thank you because you love us so much thank you because it is not you who has done this evil in our lives the enemy has come to steal from us and kill in our lives and destroy in our lives but we know that you have come that we may have life and have life abundantly for everyone on the, under the sound of my voice who is going through the scourge of the enemy. Even as your mind is renewed today to understand that God is not responsible. I therefore join my faith with you and I, 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 I decree a binding on the earth. And I command that that scourge is brought to an end in the name of Jesus. Satan, we have, you have been revealed. You have been hiding under God to claim and lay hold on this life. But the time is up. Take your filthy hands of that life right now in the name of Jesus. The scourge is over. The Bible says we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Even as they are receiving the truth about their condition today, that that pain in their body, that sickness in their life is not from God, it's from the devil. An end has come to it in the name of Jesus. Even as they are coming to an understanding that that joblessness is of the devil, that that hunger is of the devil, that that death is of the devil, they receive deliverance right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Draw us nearer, Lord. Help us to know you more. Help us to love you more. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen and amen. God bless you richly. Thanks so much for listening. God bless you all for joining us uh, on today's teaching. We hope that you have been blessed. Please and please go through these scriptures that we have shared. Go over them again. Make them yours. Hallelujah. Make them yours and fill you with God in this way. And I pray as today that we help you in the name of Jesus. Next week, by God's grace, we should round off on God is Almighty and we go on talk about God is love. You don't want to miss all these teachings. You, you want to know that God is love. This is one of the revelations that will change your life for better. And I pray that as you join us in this teaching, the Lord will continue to transform your life and bless you and anoint you and cause his face to shine upon you and your family in the name of Jesus. Thank you and God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Glory to Jesus. We believe you are blessed by that powerful teaching. You can find this teaching and other SGS teachings on our YouTube channel. Please do well to subscribe, like, and turn on the notification bell in order to receive updates about our teachings subsequently. You can also find the compressed audio version of this teaching and other SGS teachings on our website and Telegram platform. Do well to drop your questions and comments immediately after the broadcast. You can also join us every Wednesdays and Fridays at 6 p.m. as we'll be learning at the feet of Jesus. Remain blessed. Shalom.